welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, dedicated to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas V. Miris. Today I've got Carrie Gress back on the show to discuss her new book, The Anti-Mary Exposed, Rescuing the Culture from Toxic Femininity. I'm back. Happy Easter, everybody. I uh, hope you all had a wonderful Easter Triduum and uh, a nice restful time with your families. Tomorrow is the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker, which marks the one-year anniversary of the Catholic Culture Podcast. It's a project that I've been enjoying immensely, and I, I'm grateful to be able to do it. I'm grateful for your listenership. And today I'm actually talking to someone who was one of my very first guests on the show all the way back in episode four. Before the interview, I have to do just a little bit of housekeeping, including discussing a couple of new podcast projects that we're considering here at catholicculture.org that I want to get your feedback on. But first, I want to thank listener F. Ginsky for writing a really nice review of the podcast on iTunes. The review is titled, One of the Better Catholic Podcasts. The host, Thomas Miris, clearly puts considerable thought into each episode's guests. The topic and questions are timely, fascinating, and often unusual enough to really stand out from my other subscriptions. I find it hard to stop listening to an episode once I've started. Highly recommended. Thank you so much for that kind review, Efginski. And uh, yes, it's true. I do try to make a point of choosing unusual topics and things that are a little off the beaten path. Or if I'm interviewing someone who has a new book out and is sort of doing the interview circuit generally, I try to try to make it a distinctive interview. So thank you very much for that. Much appreciated. So now that we're a year into podcasting here at Catholic Culture, uh, we've been discussing some other possible projects to develop. And there's two possible projects in particular that I want to mention today, uh, just to hopefully get some feedback from you as to whether you find these interesting or would be willing to support these projects. And these would not be projects that I would be hosting as I do this one, but I would be overseeing and sort of producing them. And both of them have to do with the church fathers, actually. Uh, the first one, and we are already sort of taking steps to develop this, is to do an ongoing series of audiobooks of the Church Fathers. These would be well-produced and performed by a gifted Catholic actor we know who has training in voiceover work. And these would be made available for free in a number of different forms, both in uh episodic form as a podcast. We'd probably put the whole thing of each book on YouTube and make them available in a form that would work on various audiobook players and things like that. Now, the second project uh, would be a Church Fathers History podcast. I'm envisioning this in a similar format to one of my own favorite history podcasts, which is Peter Adamson's History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. His format is that he tells the history of Western philosophy as a continuous story in chronological order, and as the title indicates, he doesn't just jump from great man to great man. He covers even less well-known figures. He provides historical context. His podcast is easily accessible to a layperson, but it's also of interest to many professionals in the field, and it's got a fairly light tone. And his episodes are generally under 30 minutes, except every few episodes he'll do an interview with someone who's an expert in the subject matter he's just been covering in the previous uh, scripted episodes. Now, there's a lot of material out there in audio and video form on the Church Fathers. There's lectures, there's discussions, sort of individual discussions of a particular topic. But I think the great benefit of doing this in podcast form rather than as a individual or a series of lectures is that given time and funding and willingness, it doesn't need to unnaturally force the material into a certain number of episodes or a certain number of hours. Uh, it can be a long-term project which proceeds indefinitely with whatever level of detail we want to go into until a survey of the subject matter has been completed. Peter Adamson, whose show I mentioned just a minute ago, uh, has been going for several years now, and he has been doing the whole history of Western philosophy, starting with the ancient Greeks. He even covered some of the church fathers who are relevant to philosophy proper. And he's now covering Byzantine philosophy, after which he's going to move on to the Renaissance. Now, as for our own Church Fathers history series, I already have someone in mind 
who I'm hoping we could get to write and host it. Um, nothing final, no, no commitments have been made yet, but I just wanted to throw that idea out there uh, so you could tell us if that's something you'd be interested in and something you'd be willing to support. So I'd love to hear your feedback on these different ideas. You can email me anytime at podcast at catholicculture.org. Now, at catholicculture.org, we run almost entirely on donations, with the exception of a little bit of money we get from advertising on the website. So our ability to add new projects like this depends on people's willingness to support it. So to that end, we've actually just gone ahead and set up a special donation form specifically for podcast development, and that would include uh, not only sort of podcasts proper, but projects like this proposed audiobook program, which would be released in a number of forms, including as a podcast. So you can go and donate there if you are interested in supporting this work at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Now, just one more thing I promise uh, before we get to today's guest. I'm sure many of my listeners are already familiar with uh, what Catholic Culture offers other than this podcast, but I just wanted to let you know, for those who only listen to the podcast and aren't familiar with the website, I wanted to let you know that we offer quite a bit of written material as well. And the best way to get into that is to go to catholicculture.org slash newsletters. We've got five different newsletters you could subscribe to. Uh, the first one is Insights, and that will give you our commentary twice a week, various articles that are written mostly by Jeff Miris and Phil Lawler, um, less frequently by guests like Father Jerry Pekorski, and occasionally I write um, – articles myself, although I tend to be more busy with the podcast these days. We've got Catholic World News, which is Phil Lawler's domain, and it was actually the first independent Catholic news service on the internet, so you can get Catholic news headlines every business day in your inbox. Then we've got two different liturgical calendar emails. One is a preview of the current day in the Catholic liturgical year, and another one previews the upcoming two weeks of the liturgical year. And finally, for those who listen to the podcast uh, but don't subscribe to it or people who aren't comfortable with the technology of subscribing to podcasts, there's also an email newsletter that will notify you whenever the podcast comes out. So again, you can subscribe to any or all of those at catholicculture.org slash newsletters. Okay, today's guest is Carrie Gress. She's been on the show before, back in episode four. She was talking about her book, The Marian Option. She has a doctorate in philosophy from the Catholic University of America. She's the editor of Helena Daily. She's a faculty member at Pontifex University, and she writes frequently for a number of different Catholic publications online, including the National Catholic Register. Today, she's here to talk about her new book, The Anti-Mary Exposed, Rescuing the Culture from Toxic Femininity. Carrie, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much, Thomas. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. Yeah, it's nice uh, now that I've been going for a while to be able to have sort of uh, some recurring guests who I know are you know dependable for a good a good conversation. So your new book, exposing the anti Mary. What is the anti Mary? What is the anti Mary? That is a great question. The anti Mary is it really the idea came from just looking at our culture and seeing that there's this huge gap between who women are the kind of women that we're told that we should be in the culture today and who our lady is. And so it just struck me that we have this notion of an antichrist and um, certainly people think of it as one individual, but uh, St. John talks about it in one of his letters as a spirit uh, that's opposed to Christ. So uh, what the anti-Mary then is the specific targeting that's happened to women really since the 1960s. You could probably argue it's happened prior to that, but started specifically in the 1960s to get women to no longer f realize that Our Lady is the model of femininity, that she is the model uh, that leads us to Christ, and she is the, the model that leads to our, our perfect happiness. And of, of course, you know, even as I say this, it just sounds so re resoundingly ridiculous to suggest this, even, you know, particularly to a secular audience. But that's what the anti-Mary is, that we've, we're kind of marinating in it and have marinated in it so long that we don't really recognize how dramatically our culture has moved away from this understanding of Our Lady as, as model of womanhood. So, of course, Mary possesses all virtues perfectly, but with regard to women specifically, what would be the relevant virtues and the opposing vices uh, that we could see in this this spirit of anti-Mary? Sure. Well, the anti-Marian woman, of course, I mean, this is one of the fascinating things is 
is the vices of womanhood that we're seeing today are um, have been flipped and turned into virtues. So pretty much everything kind of associated with selfishness, uh, whether it's it's rage, ambition, just this radical independence that, that we think that we need um, to make us happy. And and also turning our children into the enemy. I think this is one of the biggest lies that uh, the anti marian spirit has spread is um, the first one being that in order for us to be happy, we have to act like men, we have to be like men, um, we have to aspire to men and not even really good men at that. But the second thing is that our, our children are an obstacle to our happiness, that we have to have abortion on demand, we have to have contraception, every type available to us like candy such that we don't end up being saddled with children that would, would ruin our education or our lives or you know whatever path we have planned for ourselves. It's those kinds of vices of womanhood that have, have been turned on their head to be seen as virtues in, in the culture. Can you paint a portrait of a woman who is sort of having her life run by this spirit it's such that we might recognize her in the contemporary scene. <laughs> you can imagine, you know, there's so many women out there that that speak on a daily basis. In fact, it's kind of one of those things that I think once you see what the anti Mary is, it's hard to unsee it. But Rose McGowan a couple of weeks ago said something to the effect of, you know, I had to have an abortion because I wanted to change the world. And just really this idea that that our children are absolutely going to destroy our lives. And we see that you know, constantly. And even in just last month, there was the, it was National Women's History Month. And there was, uh, you know, the day of the international womanhood. And, uh, you know, all kinds of speeches are made and statements released from the UN. And basically, all that they could do is talk about what women working instead of really talking about this idea of motherhood. You know, we've so degraded motherhood to just think that it's some sort of, you know, tawdry thing that's just awful that is going to ruin our lives. And I think that's really the, the big key that's missed. And really that that's what the, the anti-Mary pivots on is this idea that children are the obstacle instead of the a, a real gift to us. In the book, you talk about a lot of the time, the starting point for or the entry point for Satan being malcontent. Can you expand on that a little bit? <laughs> sure. You know, going back to Eve, we see Eve being tempted in the garden with, you know, God has more that he won't give you, that you could become like him. And Eve, of course, falls into that trap um, because she's she doesn't recognize what she's got is pretty amazing and great thing there. And, and we see this starting specifically in the 60s, this kind of rhetoric where women want it all where we want more. And you see this among, you know, the, the rhetoric of Gloria Steinem and a lot of the other mothers of radical feminism. And it's just this, this lie that we can have everything uh, all the time at our fingertips. And of course, any woman with any kind of sense recognizes that there are going to be seasons of our lives where we can have certain things, but we can't have others. And just this, this idea that we can have everything at all all the time is certainly not in accord with human nature, certainly not in accord with the, the way the world works, and certainly not in accord with the kind of salvation that God has in, in mind for us. So it's it starts there with this, uh, you know, women have this natural propensity to compare themselves with other women. And in that sense of, well, she's got more than I do, or she's got something I don't have. It's it's in that that Satan, it kind of opens the door for Satan to start whispering to us that, no, you should be able to have that too. And rather than recognizing that there are going to be times when we don't have everything that we want or everything that we aspire to and that God allows those things for us to grow in virtue and in other ways. That's really where the door opens. And I think it's it's something that's common to all women. There's a great book I, I probably mentioned on your show the last time called Warriors and Warriors. And the sociologist lays out really why this this happens with women. And, and part of it has to do with the fact that we're naturally, you know, when we have, because we're women, we're going to be having children, we're also physically weaker. And so there's always a sense where we have to be sort of angling for something, something more. And she, this woman's Joyce Benesford, I think is her last name that wrote this book. And um, she talks about how this is just kind of a natural process that we are, as women, we want to get, we want to angle for great things for ourselves, but also for our children. Obviously, we know that Catholicism and the, and the virtues help us temper this and help us understand when we're overstepping boundaries or when we're being led by things out of avarice or greed or envy or jealousy. But when you take away those those items, there's really no check on it. And I think this is what we're seeing a lot of 
in the culture today is this kind of unchecked envy, unchecked jealousy, unchecked greed, all of these things that are leading to this tremendous unhappiness, certainly among women, but also in the culture. So this was one of the most fresh parts of your book for me, this sort of sociological discussion about competition among women, because normally speaking about feminism, you would often focus on the relationship between women and men and women wanting what what men have or what they think men have. But you talk about this sort of illusion that if women were just in with women are, were in charge of, say, corporations or the government or whatever, we would have this more empathetic, less competitive society. But you talk about this this idea of women are actually competitive with each other, but they they can't allow themselves to appear to be competitive. I still don't quite understand it, so I'd love to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah, it's great that you don't understand it because it's such a wonderfully wonderful male thing that you just don't get it. Because it's so evident, I think, to women that there's always a sense of of competition with with other women. It's kind of hard, hardwired into us, and um, this is why Scripture speaks of the guileless woman as such an amazing person because it just doesn't happen that often. Most of us have to struggle in a certain way with with really looking at, at other women in, in a charitable fashion instead of seeing them as some kind of a threat. Uh, you know, the image always comes to mind of, of the woman with sharp elbows trying to elbow other people out. And the more that in, in this book, Warriors and Warriors, the, the more that women are sort of in competition with each other, rather than appearing to be in competition, it usually just ends up being, you know, bigger smiles and a, a better way of, of appearing sweet and sort of disarming when in fact, you know, running through her head is um, you know, <laughs> anything from, uh, you're not going to get the best of me to, you know, I'm going to destroy you. And we can kind of see this in, certainly in movies, you know, if you think of female villains, that's sort of the embodiment of, of what's going on, just this kind of ruthless sensibilities that can become overgrown in a character if it's not tempered by Christian virtues and those vices are allowed to grow. So yeah, I think that there's there's something interesting in this too, because it's it, it shows really why women need men in a certain, certain respect to sort of temper us and help us understand that we, we don't, it doesn't have to be just about sort of marking our territory and sort of protecting everything. But in fact, when and this is one of the things I love about understanding Our Lady. I mean, one of the things I didn't want to do with the book was kind of dispel a saccharine sense of who she is. We we often see her as very one dimensional, sweet, with you know eyes sort of tr- turned towards heaven in the statues that we see in churches. But we don't really think of her and in, in terms of um, her relationships, um, particularly that with God the Father. And when a woman knows that she's loved and that she's taken care of, especially when she understands that love of God the Father, then she doesn't have to have those sharp elbows and she doesn't have to act in a way that's manifestly combative, even if she's not showing signs of it. Um, she doesn't have to undermine other people. She doesn't have to feel like she's going to be you know, cut down or that she's she's in this kind of dog-eat-dog world. So I th- that's one of the things that I, I really wanted to, to talk about in the book was just to, to show that a lot of this, the behavior that we see, we're seeing from women is precisely because women don't understand that they're loved. They don't understand that they have God the Father who, you know, sees them as the apple of his eye and, and really longs for them to trust him to help bring order and beauty and goodness to their lives. And I, I think that's just the, this dramatic dynamic that that plays out in the book. I mean, for the first part of the book, of course, is is awful and hard to read in some cases. And the second part of the book is is really meant to be uplifting and and help us understand what the antidote is. But part of that antidote is this recognition of God's great love for us, and that we can rest in that instead of feeling like we have to constantly be in competition with others. If we could talk a little bit more about this, this uh, I'm still trying to understand this sort of competitive thing and this. Uh, well, okay, so feminists would probably acknowledge that women can cut each other down um, in various ways, but they would probably have a competing explanation where it has to do with the, the pressure, some kind of pressure that exer- is exerted by men uh, being in charge and men motivate women to do these things to each other or there's some <laughs> kind of internalized oppression or something like that. So let's just talk about it in the workplace based on what you've studied in this this area. What happens in the workplace with women 
uh, with a, ma- a male boss versus a female boss. Well, what's the what are the different dynamics there? Well, there's a lot of dynamics. I, I first just even want to back up and look at. I used a lot of Phyllis Chesler's book. Phyllis Chesler uh, was one of the early feminists, and she's a. I think she's a, she's a psychologist. I think she's written like something like 27 books on feminism. And one of the things that she talks about in her latest book, it's called The Politically Incorrect Guide to Feminism, I think, or Politically Incorrect Feminism, rather. And she talks about just the amazing amounts of backstabbing that happened among the early feminists. I mean, there's always this sort of sense that you get from feminists sort of smoothing things over, you know, where this sisterhood and, and peacefulness and whatnot. And again, this this illusory sense that, you know, everything is going to be so much more peaceful uh, um, if women are in charge. And Chesler just lays it out very clearly and just talks, you know, in almost in most of her chapters, there's a clear, or there's clear points about how, how much backstabbing was going on among these women and how much jealousy there was going, ha- happening among women. So we see it even, even there and especially there because of the fact that you have all these women who are so incredibly broken. Chesler calls she and others the lost girls and um, the feminism and as it was associated with television and, and the media really gave them a platform for their broken, brokenness to just kind of eat away at the culture instead of bringing them the happiness that they long for. And she also even talks about just the, the, the rampant amounts of mental illness there were among them. So that's a whole nother side issue, but it's important to know that that was at the heart of radical feminism was this, this backstabbing of the among the sisterhood. But even in the, in the workplace, you know, I've, I have one friend who worked in a, a major office and um, he would talk about how there would be this competition among the, the older women, you know, against the younger women, because the older women had been those young women at some point, sort of the it girl that got a lot of attention because she was young and attractive. And then as they grew older, they didn't, they weren't seen that way. And so there's this jealousy that was, that developed. And it's actually interesting to even look at the studies that are done on, you know, what, how many women are willing to help mentor women who are younger than they are? Well, it's something like 40% are, would, wouldn't help another woman unless she's, there's some sort of quid pro quo happening where she's actually benefiting from it, which is interesting because if you look at men, you know, someplace like the FBI, they, they call mentors uh, the rabbis where they actually are help younger agents or boys of the FBI help them with their careers and, and moving up the ladder and how can they develop themselves. But there's not really a female word for that. And I think much of it is because of this. And women are, you know, are not likely to help other women that they're not related to. So this is where you can see the importance of someone like a mother or a grandmother that, you know, there's so many great stories about the, the power of a grandmother in terms of helping the granddaughter and, and that wisdom that she passes on. But when we're in a culture where the grandmothers are these women who have bought into feminism already, they either didn't have children or they didn't see the value in sort of developing their own wisdom and virtues. So they don't have much to pass on. So we're seeing kind of this breakdown. And so this is part of the problem. I think there's a lot of women who feel like they just don't have the support that they need because it's not going to come from necessarily a colleague because she's going to feel threatened by younger women. And then they don't have the, the, either the mother or the grandmother or great grandmother to tap into their experience and wisdom in the way that we have done in the past. Let's pick up on this. You mentioned the brokenness of uh, many feminist figures. I'm sure that you could go as far back as uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. I mean, I've heard discussions of that. But l- let's talk about the the what would it be the third wave in the sixties? Second wave. Mm-hmm. Second wave. Yeah. Okay, so let's you, you talk about some of those figures in the book who had real issues with their mothers among other things. Yeah. Yeah. Chesler's book really brought this out there. She says very clearly, all, all of them uh, had issues with their mothers. Um, Kate Millett is one who had significant issues with her father, probably more so than her mother, but she was also mentally ill. I mean, it was, she was in and out of men- mental institutions. She wrote books about it. I mean, she's schizophrenic. And um, her sister, Mallory Millett has um, become a friend of mine. She helped me with this book, Mallory was uh, a follower of Kate's, more or less, as her younger sister for many years. And then finally, at a certain point, she said, you know, enough is enough. But she's now come back to the Catholic faith and is actually talking a lot about her sister, Kate, since Kate has passed away um, about two years ago. And Kate is, is, an, is an interesting character because of 
she wrote this book called Sexual Politics, but she was also really a ringleader that, that brought together a lot of these women together. And Mallory's been telling all kinds of stories about her apartment as a central location where these women would meet. And um, they're was, they was so highly influenced, not uh, certainly by Marxism, but also by the occult. And um, Mallory has just chilling stories. Some of them are in the book, others that are in some of her own publications. But, you know, women, 12 women sitting around a table, sharpening knives with a boa constrictor in the middle of the table. You know, Mallory walked into that and uh, on Halloween night one year, didn't stay long enough to see what happened to the snake or anybody else. <laughs> But, you know, horrifying realities. But they, the real goal of these 12 women, and it, it, it's always striking to me that there were these 12 women who basically, you know, would get together and they had this litany, um, kind of this anti-litany about how they wanted to destroy the patriarchy. And it was all built on on Marxist propaganda. But the idea was basically to, to destroy the family and to do that by promoting eroticism, homosexuality, promiscuity, prostitution, you know, all of these things that, that we look back now and think, you know, they've, they've accomplished pretty much all of this in our own culture and really destroyed the family. So there's these, these interesting threads of certainly Marxism, but also the occult that I think are very difficult to separate out. And um, I talk a lot in the book, just the, how this is really an extension of what happened in Soviet, in the Soviet Union just this idea that the human nature can be changed, that women can be made different than what they are. Certainly these women were anxious for that to happen because they themselves were so broken and didn't recognize that brokenness and just thought, you know, eventually we'll be happy if we keep, you know, if we get rid of men, men are the real problem instead of recognizing where the real problem was coming from, of course, in their own lives. So it's, it's an amazing thing to sort of look back and see like, why haven't we paid attention to how broken these women were and seeing that, you know, that brokenness has only rippled through society and gotten worse because of course, broken people break other people. So yeah, it's, it's incredibly sad to see these different waves of brokenness that haven't led to women's happiness at all. I mean, that's the amazing reality. Like, how much, how much more feminism can you push on us and make us real, make us still make us think that we just need more and a little bit more and then we'll be happy. In fact, the exact opposite has happened. We have just every metric shows that women are incredibly unhappy today. Related to Marxism, you even mentioned uh, in the book something about the idea that w- women becomes this this abstract concept, like uh, proletariat, where it doesn't actually necessarily relate to real women and what they want. Um, and if and if and if a woman disagrees, then she is somehow, and you see this with racial politics too. Now she's somehow disqualified as as a real woman, or she is. It's the internalized oppression or fall of uh, you know false consciousness as a to use the Marxist term or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think we and and we have so much evidence of this in terms of just how are women who don't go along with what I call the matriarchy how are they treated and you know we don't have to look far. I mean, look at how Sarah Sanders is treated or the way Sarah Palin was treated or Ann Coulter is treated. I mean, it's just it, it's amazing how. You know, it's just like a dog pile uh, that happens when when there's a woman that has the courage to speak out against what the matriarchy is doing. And, uh, you know, the matriarchy I, I really have defined as um, this kind of elite group of women. And I think it includes men now. We can um, even seeing this with the, the censorship that happened with the movie Unplanned. The real goal of all of this is to is to protect abortion, which has become you know something of a sacrament to them. Again, that playing, going back to that idea that we that we have to have that in order for women to be successful. That's that's what they believe at the core of all of it. And so they're they're controlling the media and what it is that most women are reading, hearing, seeing. As a result, you know we can see this kind of decimation across the culture, but we can also see it in the church too. I um, recently talked to a friend of mine who's widowed and friends of his said, well, why don't you just go to other parishes and, you know, see what, it, uh, if you can meet some other nice women. Well, he went to several parishes and he just said, there's just not women in that age group at the parishes. It's just absolutely been decimated because there's no other voices out there. It's com- been completely unchallenged by the culture. And so there's just so many women of every age who have bought into this largely because they don't, they don't have anything, any other, any other way to understand the world, because this is basically what's, you know, been presented to them as this is how we ought to live. And this is what's going to lead us to happiness and anything other than that, it just, it doesn't exist. Um, you have this 
this term you just mentioned, the matriarchy, I understand it's not meant to be taken entirely literally because they are so anti-motherhood right. typically. Right. But insofar as they are, they do represent a type of motherhood. It is the Freudian castrating mother. There, There is this sort of this aspect of uh, motherhood gone wrong that people don't aren't really willing to talk about but it i mean it is very uh, very common it appears not only like as with any other dynamic of motherhood it doesn't only appear in terms of like the biological relationship between mother and their children it's also a wider uh, cultural di- dynamic as to how boys and men are treated mm-hmm. and undermined mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a mommy dearest understanding, I think, of motherhood. But yeah, there is, I think this is interesting because motherhood can go wrong in two ways. One of them is, is a neglectful way. And of course, we see this in with abortion. You know, you couldn't think of a more radical way to neglect a child than to kill it. And then the other way is a stifling sense um, where we are controlling our children in a way that, that their own personality can't develop and they can't, they're not raised to be healthy, ordered human beings. We see a lot of this. I mean, this is some of the, con- the, the the problem with this notion of toxic masculinity, what we've tried to do to men. You know, it's this odd dynamic where, you know, women want to be just like men. They want to have all the, the, the seemingly privileges of men. But at the same time, they're telling men that they have to be different. The goal, of course, and Gloria Steinem's talked about this in her most recent book, about how the real goal is to really just erase any kind of gender whatsoever, to just have this gender less society, I suppose. But that's really where the damage is, is coming because it, you can't do, you know, look at, we know what's happening to young boys is they don't have any sense of who they are. And then of course the, the damage in the family where dads aren't around to teach them and to sort of launch them into their manhood. These are creating real problems. And a lot of the gender confusion that we have is because of this is, is because women are not helping their sons to separate themselves from them their fathers aren't around to help them understand who they are. Yeah, it's it's a it's a huge problem that we have in the culture. But the thing that's amazing to me too is that you know it, it, part of where all of this is stemming from is just this lack of understanding of history. I mean, we, if we look at the history of womanhood, you see that there's these two ways to go wrong. It's again, you either neglect or stifling. And we, we see these acted out every day among women. It hasn't changed. So it's it's one of those aspects that, you know, maybe if we understood human nature better and paid more attention to what it was, rather than trying to constantly change it all the time and, and deceive ourselves thinking that that can happen, you know, you then start to see these patterns. And uh, again, it, it's, a lot of it, it goes back to, to paganism, this encroaching paganism that happens whenever Catholicism and Judaism are, are weak paganism will will enter into it that we see the same patterns among myths and and whatnot throughout history so it's a it's a fascinating thing to realize as much as we think we're doing something new with feminism it's really falling back into the same old patterns of disordered womanhood and we'll get to the, the paganism in a minute it seems like the immediate consequence of the fall was a desire to protect oneself uh, a realization of one's vulnerability and a desire to protect oneself and and shield oneself in the case of both Adam and Eve. And this is exacerbated by the normal human condition of, to one degree or another, not receiving unconditional love from one's parents. And that seems particularly and poignantly true in the case of feminism. I mean, there is such a sense of self-protection and woundedness and and preemptively defending oneself by lashing out about it. No, I think you're you're absolutely right and that's that's a great general point to to point out is is and that's all the behavior sort of falls into that bucket of um I'm independent, I don't need a man. It, it, and it's funny, I think it was a few weeks ago there was maybe it was the cover of you know, something like people. It wasn't people, but it was something like that. It showed a dog on it, and it said something effective. Why? Why we need dogs? Well, can you imagine a cover ever saying why we need men? You know, just that idea that w- that women have to do everything on their own. And and it, you're absolutely right. It does come back to this notion of trying to protect oneself and not make yourself vulnerable to anyone. Really, it's incredibly tragic because this, you know, it's back to that adage: the people that need the most love are the hardest to love, because these women make themselves incredibly difficult to love because uh, their behavior is so largely 
vicious. So yeah, it's no, I think that's an, that's a great point. And, and I think seeing that also is a helpful way to sort of approach women who are struggling with this because we know that they're unhappy and obviously we, you know, we can't break through to all of them, but it, it somehow helps us rather than being irritated with them, helps us understand their brokenness and, and approach them in a way with compassion instead of total irritation. So yeah, that's a good question. I'm sure this will come up later when we talk more directly about Mary, but how can how can men well, okay, so a friend of mine uh, referred to these women as he said something like, you know, nobody likes being around a disagreeable woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he right. used the word, you know, you want to be with an agreeable woman. You don't want to be with a disagreeable woman. How how can men help the disagreeable women in their lives? It's a very sensitive thing, you know, it almost seems self-defeating in a way to lecture someone uh, who's who's already predisposed to to reject everything you say because you're a man it's a very delicate thing and i and i honestly have no idea obviously women need to to sort of police each other more in, in a way but but at the same time it is the role of men to to stand up for truth and be strong and to sort of lay down the law to a certain extent so it, it can be you know what i'm getting at but it, it's sort of a puzzling situation to be in on on the ground level in terms of social interactions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's incredibly challenging, again, because of this reason that women largely are following the advice of, of other women. And, um, you know, that was one of the fun parts about writing this book was even just looking at uh, throughout history, what is it that men love about women? Well, it's not anger and bitterness. It's not, you know, self-absorption and narcissism. These are not the traits that we hear love songs. The the words of love songs are not conveying these ideas. What are they conveying? They're conveying a kind of woman, you know, James Taylor has these great lyrics and he obviously would probably consider himself a a feminist. And yet he describes so beautifully what it is that, that women love about or men love about women. You know, there's something in the way she moves. She calms me down. There's something that she's able to sort of take a man on and hold him in her heart and give him peace and compassion, be present to him. And, and I think that's one of the things that's, that's hard for us as women, because we don't understand the power that we have through those great gifts that we have. We don't understand this notion of, of really holding people in, in our souls, of course, as well as in our arms. I mean, that's what as a mother, that's what I spend half my day doing is just embracing my children and just being close to them and near to them consoling them or encouraging them or whatever. And, you know, these aren't just meant for children, but this is this is some, one of the great dynamics of, of womanhood. And yet we've completely lost sight of how that is. So yeah, how do we how do we explain that to other women, other women? And, and how do how do men, how do men? What can I yeah. do? Well, as well, a man, my book, first of all, <laughs> that's one slice to start. But uh, no, it's. I think it's incredibly challenging, and it's. It depends. It's like evangelization in a certain respect. It depends on the woman. It's her, who she is. And I know in my own case, I had some great friends that were like older brothers to me. One in particular, I can think of, who actually would tell me. Uh, you know, uh, two now that I can think of. Actually, one was in in college. This friend of mine. We were both on the tennis team together, and um, he just said to me, "You know, it's really unattractive when a woman curses." and or use foul language. And I just took it to heart. It was like, wow, I never really thought about it before, but maybe it is. And, and I just stopped doing it. Um, and then later on in graduate school, another friend uh, just said, you know, it was, wasn't like lecturing me, but it was just one little comment like that, you know, that, that kind of behavior really uh, undermines men and doesn't make them feel like they can be your friend or be comfort- comfortable around you. And, um, you know, it's those little things that Again, it's hard because you never know what a woman's going to be re- receptive to because of the fact that we've been so conditioned to think that these things are awful and w- what men have to say isn't important. But I think a woman who's worth her salt will, you know, maybe will take it to heart and, and think about it and consider it. And I think the women that are, uh, you know, women, I guess it's a, in many respects, we have kind of a great opportunity because so many women are so incredibly unhappy. And, you know, on the one hand, it's hard because we're so broken. But on the other hand, that kind of brokenness opens us up to truth in a way that wouldn't happen if we weren't in pain. So, yeah, I think it's it's incredibly hard, but it's important that that people say something that they speak up instead of just allowing the behavior to continue to sort of tear the family apart um, or tear relationships apart. And, I, you know, even 
I have to say, I was, it was striking to me, having seen Unplanned, it just, that dynamic plays itself out all the time where you've got Abby Johnson, who's, you know, she's working at Planned Parenthood. Well, her, her husband hates it. Her parents hate it. You know, no one around her is really supporting her except for these other women. And it's, was them obviously praying for her and them, you know, loving her through that, but also being very clear, like, we are not happy about this. That kind of relationship where you can communicate those things but in a loving way, I think over time is really where the fruit is instead of, you know, running away or severing it. Because again, this is just, women have been so, had the, the wool pulled over our eyes for so long that it just takes a long time to sort of start seeing it, seeing reality as it is again. I, I, I can't remember where I read this, but it was something something I read where it basically said the position of the church, or at least at the fathers, is that if only Eve had sinned, original sin would not have been transmitted mm, to the whole mm-hmm. human race. Yeah. That it was Adam's, that she, she started it, but that it was yeah. Adam as the actual mm-hmm. head of the human yeah. family who, who was the, who put his stamp mm-hmm. on it. And so, of course, men have to be gentle and courteous with, with women. But I, I do wonder. To what degree, if men just said, okay, this stops now, would it just stop more easily than we we might think? I have a friend who just got engaged, and his fiance is coming into the church. She, she was raised by atheists and had no religious background at all, very, very leftist. And the thing that sort of I mean, she she changed her views on everything in an extremely short period of time. And what started it was having their first argument about sort of moral issues was about abortion. And and she said that after that, everything just sort of fell into place. But But what happened in that discussion, what they both agreed on was that he was the first man in her life that hadn't just sort of backed off when she started crying <laughs> in other words she she start she in this argument started mm-hmm. crying and he didn't like he didn't like let that mm-hmm. intimidate him because that can oh, be a absolutely. weapon right yeah. he didn't let that intimidate him into not saying the truth or backing down i mean he wasn't screaming at her or being a jerk but he was just being firm and like and being like no you have nowhere to hide on this you, you don't have any room to stand here and she was like panicking cuz her like this this ground was being taken from beneath her feet but he didn't let up in the interest of truth and certainly out of concern for her as well, out of love for her. And so there was, yeah, I mean, it, it, just thinking of it, reflecting on that more now, it was like there was um, there was that firmness in advocating what is true and not being intimidated by sort of the feminine arsenal, but also that firmness, in a sense, I think provides a sense of security when you have let go of those things that you were clinging to, does that make sense? I'm just thinking of this now, but at that that as an aspect of it. So it doesn't have to be just that we're ripping people away from their their ideologies, but there also is that very firmness like provides a consolation when you're willing to let go. You know, one of the things I I did not want to do with this book was to beat men over the head with anything because I feel like men have been beat over the head with everything for, you know, 50 years now. But I I wanted to look honestly, and and I don't don't go to great lengths discussing it in the book, but I wanted to just even look at, you know, what is going on here in terms of men and why are they not being more firm in, in their positions regarding these moral issues. And you know, again, obviously it comes back to the messaging and, you know, you're not a woman, you don't have a uterus, you can't talk about these things, you know, all of that rhetoric. But, you know, even look at, at Adam, I mean, this is before the fall. He, men just don't want to argue with women. I mean, that's just a fundamental issue. And again, as you mentioned, we have this arsenal where, you know, we just start crying or have these different ways to sort of get our way, wittingly or not. So, such that we don't have to necessarily bow to what men are suggesting or, or saying to us all the time. But I think that you're absolutely right, that there is something incredibly powerful about a man who understands that there's a lot more at stake than just a, you know an argument or just a, a yes or no answer. But in fact, it really has these ripples that are going to last for generations and you know among his own children 
and his own family um, and his own life. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot to be said for uh, that kind of leadership and, and what that can do for a woman because there's something incredibly unhealthy about a woman who thinks that she's, when, when she has this sense that she's in control of, of everything and the man is just docilely, you know, going along with her will. And that, that just puts us in an incredible position for, again, this kind of vice taking over instead of having it balanced out by, you know, husband or a father who can say, no, that's, it's not going to be good for you. We're just not going to do that. So yeah, there's something, and that's what happens. Obviously we see this in the moral life. I mean, that's what God, the father does is that there's a reason why sin hurts because it's, it's, it's a way of helping us to see like, it's just not good for you. So anyway, I think that those kinds of things, even if we're mad in the moment, Upon reflection, we end up become we we grow from them, and we st- we respect these people, these men in our lives more if they have that capacity to tell the truth rather than just pander to us. Let's take a brief detour into another aspect of modern feminism that you mentioned, which is the occult and more specifically goddess worship. What are the origins of that, and what specific forms has it taken? Yeah, now this is a bit, was a really interesting aspect of, of the book. Goddess worship is something that's been on the rise. I, I think that I just read a statistic that there are actually more people practicing Wicca and witchcraft now than there are Presbyterians. So it, it's definitely on the rise. And it's one of these things that it, it, it's, it's striking to me to even see how there's something fundamental about understanding the feminine and um and the role that plays in our in our own intellects and understanding of the world and we see that again it, with you know with protestantism you've wiped out the woman you you've wiped out our lady you wiped out any kind of feminine aspect to understand god the father like we have obviously in catholicism there's this deep sense of women who are in the convent and that kind of relationship that they have with the trinity all of that has been wiped out so you kind of, you know, it's this windswept house sort of where the feminine isn't even acknowledged as a reality. And so what happens is women, I think this is by and large, the, the roots of fem- radical feminism is that women see that the only way that they can actually be faithful is to, t- is to imitate men or to aspire to the masculine role that men have within the church. Um, I think that's the start of it. Um, and that played itself out in so many different ways. But in any event, the Rather than understanding who Our Lady is, they 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 shifted and pivoted to to go back to paganism, to go back to this kind of goddess worship that we see again whenever paganism starts growing, and it's it's hugely influential in terms of the culture. Whether it's pop music, uh, there's all kinds of movements going ar- around in terms of book publishing. This these are you know twenty thirty years old kinds of things that have just kind of become ingrained. A lot of new age movement crystals, you know, all of these kinds of things, but they have a, a real, uh, obviously a, a, a denigrating effect upon women because of the fact that it's such a distorted view of womanhood, especially when you're, you're actually worshiping goddesses. And I, I talked to an exorcist about this, but as far as, you know, who are, who are these goddesses, what's going on here? And he, he's two in particular, um, a Jezebel spirit, which is a spirit of, of womanhood, you know, going back to the Jezebel in scripture where she flaunts the authority of men and she just sort of rules over everything. So that's certainly one of the influential ones. But the the bigger one is um, this Lilith, spirit of Lilith. And Lilith is is one, a name that has popped up a lot. Um, there was this thing called the Lilith Fair. Many years ago, Sarah McLaughlin started this with uh, other female artists. I think it maybe ran four or five years and finally disbanded. But um, there was also the Lilith Fund that was set up after the, the hurricane blew through Houston a couple of years ago, and it was an emergency fund for women to get abortions. Lilith has been this character that keeps recurring. She's actually featured, uh, there's a book, George MacDonald's written about her by C.S. Lewis. Uh, the White Witch is actually based on her. She, it, the name Lilith, actually the word lullaby comes from a very ancient form of um, Arabic that is, is actually a, a prayer to protect us from Lilith. So she's been highly influential, and yet that she's very much lauded. Like the aspect of her, she's she's known largely to seduce men and kill babies. So that aspect of her, I think we can see alive and well in radical feminism because it's pretty much what the goal has been in many ways. And so she's she's lauded by current feminists as this icon that that women should really become like father ripperger who uh, the exorcist is was telling me actually that um the irony with her is that you know demons manifest as 
uh, male. They they're they're gendered less because they're angels, um, fallen angels. But they generally manifest as males. But um, Lilith in particular will kind of shape shift and appear when she appears as a, a female. So it's just this form of trickery. It's not she's Lilith isn't even female. Just in in cases where it's it's convenient to mislead people. So anyway, it's it's a fascinating thing to see. You know what what is held up because again this human desire to worship something and to be able to feel like they're connecting with something but this again happens when the church is so weak and doesn't have the ability to really help women be formed properly in a way that that brings their full flourishing but instead this distorted version of it you mentioned a couple of different pop stars in the book who were involved with sort of occult ritualistic things in some of their performances. Uh, there was a recent thing with Beyonce where she dressed up as this Yor- Yoruba goddess. Well, she was pregnant with twins because this this goddess, I guess, I forget the name, is associated with childbirth. And uh, that was a big high profile thing that she did. If I can just share my own, I have my own sort of Beyonce story. I had this, I'm a musician and I had this gig coming up maybe like three years ago. And it was just like some small gig where we'd be playing covers. I hadn't played with the the people before. And one of the things they listed was this Beyonce, Beyonce song that I was supposed to learn. I was listening to it, and it was very repellent. It was, I mean, the lyrics were pornographic, but there was something other than that that really put me off. There was kind of like this this dark spirit behind it. Like there was this, I had this like very visceral sense of repulsion when I was listening to this and it was, I could only describe it as being like kind of like a spirit of self-worship because this song, she's describing herself having sex with her husband and it is very much like I'm looking at myself and adoring myself while in the act of sex. And it, it was very uh, unsettling and I was like, okay, I, I can't play this and I ended up not doing the gig because of that. But uh, I had talked to a friend of mine and, and about that, and and he was like, "Well, yeah, that's not surprising." And he told me about this sort of occult thing with with Beyonce, which is that. And I and I looked this up, and it, and it's the case that she actually has talked about that there is this like being that enters into her when she's performing that allows her to be dirty and sexual and nasty, which she says is not her real personality. I, I'm sure a lot of people haven't are, aren't aware of this, but I'm, I'm saying it because it's hard to overstate how influential she is on young women. I mean, she is one of the most influential people in our society. You know, she talks, she, 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 in the interview I was reading, she called it an alter ego, but, but the way she described it was not like, oh, I invented this you know, mm-hmm. artistic persona. She said like, like she or something, right? Yeah, she she said that she like stepped out. I think it was like some BT program, and she stepped out on stage and she raised her arms, and then it came into her, and and it like so she's channeling this in her performance. So as my friend said, like it doesn't even matter if it's a song about like pretty flowers or something. She's still channeling this this demon. And around the same time, I found this interview with Lady Gaga where she talked in a very straightforward manner about how she said she said she had this demon who follows her around when she's on tour and torments her and she described these nightmares she's she had about watch watching herself on a table being tortured by demons and and she even gave it a name just to like make it more familiar so it, it's you know once you sort of get used to this idea that there are actually demons at work in our wider wider culture. I mean, it, illumin- it, it illuminates a lot. And I'm not some. I was never someone who went and sort of assumed things were demonic, or even if there was something weird about them, or just sometimes people are just exploring and being creative, and they're u- making use use of certain imagery, or they're trying to shock or whatever. But in certain cases, I mean, there's a very real uh, demonic oppression or possession situation going on Mm -hmm. yeah no without a doubt and i i think you're you're right and i think it's it's a lot the culture is a lot more saturated in it than we realize and um yeah it's it's always very eye-opening when you hear those kinds of stories and you know certainly talk with exorcists about what's what is actually happening 
Okay, so let's let's talk about Mary now. Um, seems like a good <laughs> a good segue. So Mary, obviously, there's no question that that she has you know is more powerful than any of these these spirits or forces. So so that we don't even need to sort of prove that to to our audience. But um, how can we? understand Mary as a, as a powerful woman. You know, some feminists will say, yes, Mary was is powerful. We should realize she's not just this meek, you know, person or whatever. She's very powerful, but they don't seem to understand what is the source of her power. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good question. And I think it's that's what's so challenging about talking about Mary in our ages, because we want to frame it in terms of what her power is, but her power is of God. Like she's, it all comes from God. And because she's pure, his power and his gifts and her gifts are, you know, united and are, everything comes because her will is united with his will. And that's, it's really, it's, you know, it goes back to that notion when I'm weak, he's strong, that basic idea. But how do you explain that to women in our culture today in such a way that's actually sounds compelling? And I think that's one of the things, one of the challenges I was really faced with in writing this book, because like I said earlier, we think of her in very saccharine terms, even the word meek, you know, sort of has us heading to the hills because we don't really understand what that is as a virtue. We, th- we see it as a doormat hood. Um, and that's what most women kind of associate Mary with is that, that, you know, the pendulum of the mind swings from one extreme to the other. And we don't want to find that Aristotelian mean, but of course it exists. So what I did was really lay out who Our Lady is in terms of the three desires of every woman's heart. Um, and just show how it is that she's a response to all of those things, how it is that our desires of our heart are met when we model after Mary, because she's, she's obviously a guide, but also she's a woman. So she has these desires the same as we do. They're just met perfectly because of her perfection. So the first one, of course, would be that we, we all desire to be known and, and loved. And uh, you know, our lady has that in spades because of the fact that she has this close relationship and this perfect trust in who God the Father is. Um, the second thing is is obviously, or maybe not so obviously, all women have a desire to be good or to do the good, rather, um, to do good things. And and this was uh, you know something that struck me about reading a lot of this radical feminist literature is in all of it, there's still this desire to do good for others. It's just that they don't have an ordered understanding of what that good is. So when you know, you can read about the things that they did, you know, driving women to abortion clinics and helping set up illegal abortions and all of these kinds of things, it's still that desire to do good for other people. They just don't realize that it's not really good. And Our Lady, of course, offers us that model of how can we be perfectly good? Well, the the, the way to be perfectly good is to align our wills with God. And uh, I looked at a lot of different saints, female saints in particular, someone like Catherine of Siena or St. Helen or St. Lucy, uh, you know, these women, St. Joan of Arc, these women did amazing things and incredible good for the world in such a way that makes any kind of good that current day women are doing just pale in comparison, not only because it's not necessarily good, but also because it's just ineffective when in, in comparison, because it's not united with God's will. So the true good comes in a woman's life when she has her will united with God. And that's when, you know, the fruit just becomes abundant. Even in someone like St. Therese of Lisieux, who, you know, never left the convent, died at a very young age and arguably didn't really do anything, um, you know, according to our contemporary standards. But there's just, that's when God can be fruitful in our, when we make ourselves small and he's allowed to be large in our life. That's where the real fruit of goodness comes from. And that's where, why we have that desire so, such that we can turn to him to do the good in our lives. And then the third thing, of course, is this desire for beauty and to be beautiful. And um, we we see this in, s- distorted in so many ways in the culture, whether it's vanity or sensuality or, but it's it's just there. I mean, it's beauty, the beauty industry is, you know, multi-billion dollar industry and um, it's it's a strong driver for women. And um, but why is that? It's not. It, it's again because we are called to reflect the beauty of God, and that's what Our Lady does. In fact, you every single apparition that's ever happened of Our Lady, the people came away saying people that saw her came away saying she was the most beautiful woman in the world. And even Saint Bernadette said, you know, she was so beautiful you would just want to die so you could see her again. So that that her beauty is again a, a kind of a, a marker for us to understand that desire that we have for beauty 
but it doesn't come through our own vanity. It comes through, again, that, that self, selflessness, that offering of ourselves for others. That's where the real beauty comes from. And, and you know, Mother Teresa's was one of those great examples of obviously not a very attractive woman, but everybody who saw her said she's so beautiful. Well, it's this, you know, je ne sais quoi that she had that you can't put your finger on why she was beautiful, but that's what happens in holiness. So all of these desires that we we have that we're struggling with in the culture our lady has in spades, and that's why she can be a model for us, even if we don't understand meekness and and um, being docile to the Holy Spirit. These things can come if we can just start to understand that she's. We need to get to know who she is, and that's really the first step: is trying to figure out who our lady is, and and then we are called to live in this relationship with her. That she does want to mother us and mentor us, and and bring us to happiness and joy and peace. And um, those are things that obviously the world can never, can never give us. You talked about this, um, this idea of active receptivity as the sort of model for imitating Mary and for being fruitful in the way that she is. Yeah. Active receptivity. I think, again, uh, it's, this is, we're not talking about being a doormat, but we're talking about actually being someone like Joan of Arc. God has a mission for each of us. How do we, how do we manifest that? And um, how do we live that out in a way that, that we are receiving from the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit wants us to do, and then acting on it um, in a way that's sometimes very bold and very unique that we see among the saints. And at other times, it's very mundane and, and not interesting, and yet there's incredible fruit from, from all of it. And all of that, of course, you know, God and Our Lady know the personality of each person, know the mission of each person, and can work with us on an individual level rather than it being some sort of cookie cutter, one Christian looks exactly like the other kind of attitude or pattern. How can we get a sense of how invested Mary was in the mission of her son? I think that's a good question in terms of just recognizing, again, this this reality of God, Adam and Eve, and Christ could not have come without Our Lady. And we know, you know, she was at the foot of the cross and she saw everything that happened to Christ. And she went through all of that. I mean, it, it, as a mother, to think about watching a child go through that is, you know, devastating. And even to just think about the fact that she she knew all of that was for us. So there's this incredible investment in, on that level. But I think we failed to even look at how this dynamic of uh, you know, she, she was sort of the ultimate victim in terms of seeing her, watching her son go through that and, and witnessing that. And and she, by all accounts, she should actually be incredibly angry with us and hate us because of what we did to her son. And yet it's the exact opposite. She's She knows what it cost him and she loves us because she, you offer that to us so willingly. So yeah, I think that between just who she was and her yes to what the Holy Spirit asked her to do to be the mother of Christ, but then going through Calvary with him and experiencing all of that, it's, you know, meditating on that is, I think, brings a lot of clarity, especially to those of us who are mothers, just what kind of a sacrifice she made and, and knows that her son made for us. There seems to be something in that sympathy, in that sort of other-oriented investment uh, that tells us a lot about the role that women can play and their gift in relating to uh, not not only their children but the men in their life, their husbands or or whoever else. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've I've thought a lot about is just this idea of what our bodies can tell. You know, theology of the body kind of ideas about what our bodies can tell us about what women have, the gifts that women have, and um, you know, even uh, I love to just point out that women's arms are shaped differently than men's are. If you, you know, your palms up, you put your arm out straight, a woman's arm is actually bent slightly so that we can hold babies better. And of course, we have wombs, we have hips made that we can carry children to term. Um, all of these things are, are, are symbols of what it is that we have the capacity to do, which is to carry others in their lives to you know, even thinking about good mothers, what do they do? Even when they're not, their children aren't around, they're still carrying them in their prayers and their thoughts and thinking about ways to help them and praying for them, all of that. And and we even see this with Our Lady. I, I didn't understand until recently this idea of, it says over and over in scripture, she pondered all of these things in her heart. What's she doing with that? She's 
she's holding these ideas because they're beautiful and they're important and she's praying for things and they're, she's, she's carrying them. So I think that women have this incredible capacity to carry others and to care for them in that journeying with them. That's, it's, you know, it's written right into our, our bodies, but um, it's also important for us to do that on a spiritual level where we, we travel with and are compassionate with other people. And this is one of the reasons why we have the capacity both to multitask, but also to really be dialed into other people and see what their needs are and be perceptive about that. And I know this is one of the funny things I've seen in my own relationship with my husband is, you know, just the different things that I pick up on that he doesn't pick up on in interpersonal relationships. And a lot of that is just, again, because we are tasked with, with caring for others and their, their needs. And it requires someone selfless to do that. You can't see the needs of others if you're so focused on yourself. There's just no way to do that. And that's an important aspect of, of womanhood is sort of getting beyond ourselves. And that's, again, where we find ourselves, of course, is, is in that giving of ourselves away, giving away of ourselves. Going back for a minute before we wrap up to the point you mentioned about beauty, you made a really great observation about this famous Dostoevsky quote, beauty will save the world, that you you hear a lot in Catholic circles. And uh, maybe it's because he was a novelist, but everybody goes right to the arts and and the liturgy. But you, you point out that also the beauty of women mm-hmm. has the capacity to save, to save the world. And it seems so obvious once you point it out, right. but it never really occurred to mm-hmm. me. Well, and I think that's one of the what what is ha- why why Satan has attacked women because he knows that we're the soil of the culture, and when you can make women no longer beautiful, when you can distort them in such a way that their beauty is is only only seen as something that's sexual or vain, then you've really got everybody because men don't, don't have it. They don't know what to look for in a woman anymore. They don't know. They have this desire of their heart, this yearning for something beautiful, something calming, something that, that can hold them. And they don't know how to fulfill that. And so it ends up, you know, and this is why we're seeing it's just such a dramatic increase in pornography. And because those means just needs cannot be met on a spiritual level so that men are trying to fulfill them on a physical level. And again, it's, you know, Sisyphusian. It's never, they're never going to be able to fill that gap. And I you know obviously women can only fill that to a certain degree. It's a, it's a desire for God ultimately, but women have the capacity to help get them there, to be that bridge, to help them understand God. And women have always done this and still have the capacity to do that. And we've, we've kind of forgotten that, that we are either a bridge to hell or a bridge to heaven. Um, and our beauty, even unwittingly, in, in fact, generally unwittingly, um, is what helps get men there and our and our children there. It's an interesting to draw a contrast with the contemporary fashion and beauty industry. Of course, there is plenty of you know help for women to who who want to look beautiful that can be found with you know modern commerce. But the fashion in the high fashion world in particular is such a strange place where the clothes aren't really anything that you would ever actually wear. And I, I often see, you know, walking around New York, I see advertisements for various, you know, fashion lines or col- perfumes, whatever. I'm always sort of mystified by the facial expressions of these models. You, in, in the book, you quote this line from Gertrude von Lefort about the face, the, 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 the faceless mask of womanhood. I think she was referring to that whole scene. And uh, it's really interesting because there's sort of like... I don't, it's hard to describe whether it's a, a, a there's a particular facial expression you see a lot it's like is it a pout is it supposed to be an intimidating look it there's something about it that it's like it's supposed to be it's related to seduction somehow and yet it isn't seductive at all like it's not attractive it's like some not the platonic idea idea of seduction but it's like some twisted version of that. I'm sure you can envision yeah, what no, I'm talking about, exactly. it, but it's it's very hard to describe because it's not a facial expression that you ever see in real life. And it's like, who are these women and what are they thinking when they're making this face? And what am I supposed to take away from this mm-hmm. weird, like well, it's that, sort of drugged out, seductive expression? Yeah, zombie-esque. And yeah, I think that there's this is comes back yeah, to that sort to of it. sense of aloofness then and um this element of sort of right, cool that's exactly and, it. you know, we don't have the capacity, to, we're, we're not going to be emotional, we're just going to be sort of detached from all this. Um, so yeah, aloof detachment, I guess, would be a, a good way to describe it. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's amazing how 
you know, once you point that out, you just see it everywhere. What that what that face is, and uh, it's certainly not happy. It's uh, there's nothing that draws you in about it, um, unless you're being drawn in on some sort of sexual level. But yeah, by and large, you're you're right. There's like no one lives that way. <laughs> so yeah, it's really it's kind of horrifying when you. When you I see. guess it's supposed to be fierce or whatever. Yeah. It's again, it's these, it's this, it's this mask. Um, it's this, it's this persona that's put on that uh, women don't really have that right. persona. There's a kind of a d- detachment, yeah, aloof detachment, I guess is um, self protection. Yeah. It goes back yeah, to I that. Think I think it guess. is, it is, it does come back to that that idea of somehow I'm in control of the situation and not really engaged in it, but I'm, I'm kind of lord, a lord, a lord of this situation or in charge of this situation. So yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. So we we really need the security that comes with knowing that we're loved and we we can be vulnerable and we can be childlike and we don't have to put on because everybody does that of course it's not just women it just seems to come back to that that idea of vulnerability and humility and you can't really be humble without trusting that that you're loved and that humility isn't ultimately just going to get you you know mashed into the dirt yeah no, you're absolutely right. And that's that that dynamic that's just incredibly hard to explain to people unless they've either seen others do it or live it or witness it. Um, and that's really where grace comes into in terms of just we have uh, we have to pray for women. And, and I think that by and large, it's become a topic that people are just so tired of, um, largely because it, it makes men feel guilty. And it, it's just women have really uh, made themselves unlovable and um so yeah just to, it kind of builds on itself and um yeah we really just need to start praying for women very specifically by name to try and bring some disgrace to their lives to see the the, the reality of how much they are loved and that they have a mission and that they they're, they're not meant to live these incredibly destructive and unhealthy and largely unhappy lives Okay, we have to wrap up now, but the book, again, is The Anti-Mary Exposed, Rescuing the Culture from Toxic Femininity, and I'll also link to our previous interview on the show notes page for today's episode, which is catholicculture.org slash episode 36. Also, I definitely recommend that people check out your website, helenadaily.com, which is sort of a curated five days a week newsletter, bringing together some of the best Catholic content on the internet. It's geared towards women, but I find a lot of valuable content on there myself. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Thomas. Today's reading is from the seventh letter of Plato. It's a very beautiful passage where he's describing how to test someone to see if he is suited for the life of philosophy. You must picture to such men the extent of the undertaking, describing what sort of inquiry it is, with how many difficulties it is beset, and how much labor it involves. For anyone who hears this who is a true lover of wisdom, with the divine quality that makes him akin to it and worthy of pursuing it, thinks that he has heard of a marvelous quest that he must at once enter upon with all earnestness, or life is not worth living, and from that time forth he pushes himself and urges on his leader without ceasing, until he has reached the end of the journey. This is the state of mind in which such a man lives. Whatever his occupation may be, above everything and always he holds fast to philosophy and to the daily discipline that best makes him apt at learning and remembering, and capable of reasoning soberly with himself, while for the opposite way of living he has a persistent hatred. Man, I love that part about having the divine quality which makes one akin to wisdom. There's a lot to draw out from that on both a natural and a supernatural level. Okay, if you listen this far, then please don't forget to email me at podcast at catholicculture.org to give me your feedback on the ideas for new projects that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. And uh, have a wonderful week. I'll see you next time. 